This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Your host, Andrew Donaldson. This is Heard Tell. Uh, it's Heard Tell Show. I'm Andrew Donaldson. It is Tuesday, June the 14th, year of our Lord 2022. Glad to be back with you. I've missed you. No, it's been a minute. We had to take some extra time off while I continue to recover for some health stuff. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but glad to be back with you. A little bit different show today because I've been taking time off. We have a couple of interviews in the hopper that we haven't got to you yet. So we're going to give you a double header today. Two young voices contributors who are fantastic in their fields. First of all, we're going to go down under Pavel Fitznik. Uh, we're not the only country in the world that's having problem with fuel prices. Australia's got that same problem. They also just had an election. And they also have similar thoughts on ways to deal with the fuel prices, like tinkering with fuel taxes, things like this. So a little bit of a perspective from down under our friends in Australia and our friend Pavel Pachtik is going to be joining us from Young Voices. Also on the program today, another interview. We're going to talk a little bit student loans. Sean Tima, uh, another Young Voices contributor, had a great conversation with him about the student loan debate, about forgiving it, about big education, about the fact that if we forgive the loans without doing any kind of educational reform, are we going to make it better or worse, the issue at hand? So we'll get into that as well. In the meantime, there's been some big news items that have gone on, and I know folks have been asking about it, so we'll just deal with a couple things real quick. The January 6th hearing started, and I, one of the themes of that that folks have started to talk about is who is and isn't watching it. It occurs to me that this is something that we're just going to have to learn to deal with in our society. Uh, back when I was in coming up through school and first started studying things like philosophy and worldviews, Situational ethics was kind of the buzzword. That's what you wanted to avoid having. You wanted to have an overarching principles and you wanted to stick to what you meant and what you said and not have situational ethics, meaning you change what you are and who you are to fit the situation. There's plenty of examples of that in the political discourse of late. But it occurs to me now that with technology, we've gone a step past that. We not only have situational ethics, we now have a la carte truth, which means you can pretty much only hear what you want to hear from the media. All this great technology, like me being able to do Herd Tell from my home, broadcasting worldwide. We're going to have Pavel on today. He's in Australia. I was in West Virginia when I recorded that conversation with him. Anywhere I got a cell signal and a little bit of Wi-Fi, I can pretty much do this program and get it to you. Wherever you have a phone or device or computer, you can listen to it. This is amazing technological development. We don't have to have network TVs or a radio station license. But part of that means is everybody gets a say, and you can pick and choose what you want to listen to. Now, hopefully, you listen to programs like ours where we try to the best of our ability to deal with truth. We don't just go with trends. We don't just stick to an ideology blindly. We challenge ourselves. We listen to dissenting opinions, and we try to get to the truth as best we can understand it and adjust from there. Not everybody wants to do that. In fact, a lot of people don't want to do that. And a lot of people are making a lot of money and making pretty good livings harboring in not truth. Now, the buzzword of that is misinformation. Now, that can go a two-edged sword in a hurry because one person's misinformation is another person's propaganda or another person's scam job or grifters or whatever you want to call it. But the thing is, and the truth is, you can't make people deal with the truth, especially in this a la carte society that we have now a la carte is of course that culinary term you know how i love my food you can order bits and pieces from here think of it like a buffet you can go and just get what you want if you don't like the okra that's fine you can get the zucchini whatever the case may be with the january 6 hearings there's a lot of coverage and a lot of commentary about who isn't watching it and the truth of the matter is you're not going to make them watch it and even if they watched it they wouldn't believe it anyway because they've already made up their mind about it 
They've already found their news sources that will reinforce their opinions on it. And there's a danger there, too, for the folks that are conducting the January 6th hearings to just think that they've got the all knowing, all seeing, all being truth as well. The fact of the matter is you can pick and choose what you listen to. Personal responsibility has kind of become a dirty word. Nobody wants to deal with it. But when it comes to information, especially in the information age we live in now, where you have the entire depth and breadth of human history in the palm of your hand, if you own a cell phone, all you got to do is Google it, or you don't have to do that. You can just ask your phone to tell you something. It's all on you whether you want to believe the truth or not. And in this coverage where folks are saying, well, so-and-so ain't watching the hearings, well, if they just watch it, they'd believe, no, probably they wouldn't. I don't have an answer to that. Nobody does. How do you fix that? I don't know. But we need to realize it's a problem. People can believe whatever they want to believe, and they can get the reinforcements to believe it. January 6th was a horrible day. It was a criminal day. It was a dark day in American history. Now, you can talk through the shades of gray that's involved in that, but it was bad. No, the election wasn't stolen. No, there wasn't widespread fraud. No, that 2000 mule nonsense or the jackass felon that is pushing it for his own profit has got a point. He's wrong. They're all wrong. January 6th was wrong, but there's plenty of people that will never believe it, and they can find just enough information to get down into their information bunkers that they've built for themselves so that they never have to deal with truth. We can rail against it. We can do our best to fight against it. We can evangelize and proselyze about what the truth really is to people who we know aren't being honest and aren't being truthful, but there's limits to it, and we need to understand those limits which means we need to be more resolute than ever in what we do believe. How do you function in an a la carte truth society? You make sure you get all of the above as much as possible, the widest possible perspective, the most influence from different opinions that you can get, and make sure that you've got the truth. Because in the end of it, all you can do is control yourself, your own personal responsibility, and making sure you're purveying in the truth. Otherwise, what's the point? You're not even going to know that you're wrong, which is where those people are now. We're going to do more Hurt Tell. Double interview portion of the show today as I continue to recover. Hopefully get my voice back. We got great guests signed up for the rest of the week. We'll be back with Pavel Fitznik in Australia right after this. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Let's go down to Australia because we've talked enough about America lately. Uh, our buddy Pavel Fraser is back on the program. We're going to talk a little gas prices with him. My friend, how are things down under? Uh, they're good. Uh, we just had an election, which may or may not change things, uh, but fuel prices are as high as ever. Yeah. Uh, talk about that for a second because I know America, we, we have rightly been accused of being a little myopic. We kind of think a lot about ourselves and not a lot about the rest of the world. Uh, but the rest of the world is also having the same fuel uh, high prices that we have. Now, normally most of the world, especially uh, Britain, uh, especially Europe, I lived in Germany for years. Fuel was always three times higher there than it was in the state. It's not unusual for overseas to have higher fuel prices than us, with the exception of the Middle East. What's it normally like in Australia? Is this really abnormal? Just give people some background on what fuel prices day to day are like in Australia. Yeah. Um, so traditionally before COVID, uh, fuel prices probably would sit around anywhere from like $1.25 to $1.40, maybe $1.50, you know, for premium fuel. Um, and if you live in a rural area. Um, so that, that, that's, you know, pretty much anything since 2010. Before 2010, uh, the early 2000s, you know, would, would have fuel for a dollar a litre. Um, currently, though, 
Uh, fuel prices are uh, about two dollars to twenty a litre in some places. Um, they were, you know, about just as high um, a couple of months ago when we had even higher taxes on fuel. Um, so it's definitely unusual in Australia. Now, your government did something that our government has hinted at, except our folks kind of started decrying it right off the bat and they dropped it because we're in election year and they don't want to do anything too controversial. Uh, they started fiddling around with gas taxes. Uh, let folks know how does the gas tax work, work in Australia. Here in America, that's usually money for things like infrastructure and stuff. It becomes kind of a slush fund for infrastructure projects, that sort of thing. How's the gas tax work there and what was the proposal to half it and the effect there? Yeah, so, um, well, I guess we raise fuel taxes for the same reasons. They're meant to be spent on infrastructure and roads and things like that. Um, obviously, not always is, is that money spent on roads and infrastructure. Um, it's quite a difference between what's raised and what's spent. But uh, the way we raise our fuel, fuel taxes normally is uh, it's raised per litre per liter and not on the actual value of the fuel. So at the moment, well, before they cut the taxes, it was uh, 44 cents um, per litre and it would go up with CPI, so inflation. Uh, every year um, they would revise the number and that um, fuel tax would go up. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of other taxes, including GST that we pay on top of um, fuel tax sometimes. And then truckers um, will also have to pay an additional road charge um, on their fuel. Uh, because of the extra damage they do to the roads. Uh, but that's pretty much how it works in Australia. Now, um, the problem here, and you are writing in Spectator Australia version. We have, of course, England and American versions of Spectator. You wrote, though, that pro part of the problem here is when you start fiddling with the gas taxes, especially halving it, you know, a real big number swing. What you're really doing is, aside from a tax cut, it starts manipulating the markets because we all understand, and we've been talking about it a lot the last couple of years, gas prices are a lagging indicator. Those things, you know, what's happening with the gas pump, that stuff from six months, 18 months ago, a year ago, that shows up at the pump. So what you're really doing is artificially uh, messing around with the market, and that's where you get the adverse effects. Yeah. So the most disproportionate, well, the most um, damaging thing, I guess, to the fuel prices is, is just the way that the taxes are raised. So they're not they're not proportional. It's not ten or twenty or thirty, forty percent on the actual value of the fuel, but it's a, a fixed uh, tax. No matter how mu how much um, the, the price of oil is actually worth, um, you know, you must pay a minimum of forty four cents per litre on that fuel. So during lockdown, fuel pr uh, fuel prices crashed. Um, as uh, oil dropped, um, we got to about 90 cents a litre, which is, you know, hasn't been done for 15 years. Um, but it could have dropped a whole lot lower if we had a proportional tax um, that was, you know, a, a, a proportion to the value of the actual product. But by having a, um, a, a levy that's, you know, fixed to the fixed per litre, um, it acts as a price floor, it, it, which manipulates the market. Yeah, Pavel Fitzner, our friend down in Australia, joining us. Uh, things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in a sequence. You just mentioned it. Uh, Australia had some really strict lockdowns, especially on the East Coast, Sydney, those areas. Uh, we talked to some of our Aussie friends. They were like, yeah, we can't even go to the market without getting hassled. What part of that effect has it? Because people are coming off of very severe lockdowns. They were controversial lockdowns. Now you got soaring fuel prices. I would say the cultural response to these, we're talking about it on a policy level. I got to imagine these things become cumulative with people getting frustrated. Yeah, um, there was a lot of frustration with the lockdowns. There was protests um, and they got, you know, harassed by the police and tracked down. And basically every one of the people in the protests, um, you know, got traced and fined, things like that. Um you know, there definitely has been pushback, but not as much as I would have expected, um, especially we just had our um, election, um, changed our prime minister. Now, there was a whole bunch of minor parties that were running on a um, anti-mandatory vax campaign or, a, you know, anti-lockdown campaign, you know, never again. And um, they spent millions of dollars and they really didn't do as well as I thought. Um, bo both of the major parties had swings against them, but... Um, you know, they, they went to uh, minor leftist parties instead. Now, the Aussie electorate tends to be, um, I don't mean this politically, I just mean temperamentally, they tend to be pretty moderate. You don't have really huge electoral changes per se. Things kind of 
come and go in waves. Uh, how much of this change politically, though, was, you know, the Scott Morrison government, they've been in power for a while. The conservatives have been in power for a while. I, I got to imagine you're talking about why the, the the parties of the moment, for lack of a better term, or the anti-government parties, they probably just they didn't do as well as people thought. Was a lot of the government changeover just kind of some inertia and fatigue, and then this was just the last little bit to push change? Is that more accurate than people actually just putting, getting trapped in the moment and going, oh, that's what did it? Uh, well, there was a whole bunch of blunders by the uh, by Scott Morrison and the Liberal Party before COVID. Um, you know, there was things with the bushfires um, and also during COVID, the, the actual um, vaccination um, rollout was stuffed up. Um, but Scott Morrison is a pretty unlikable person, um, doesn't really lack the charm, uh, doesn't really have the charm that it needs to be a, a good leader. So, you know, he made all these mistakes, you know, before COVID um and you know which turned a lot of people away from him but he you know he kind of gained that respect back um but then COVID happened and realistically between the two major parties there really wouldn't have been much of a difference um between you know how they would have handled COVID there could have been things done better of course um, by the Liberals and by uh, Scott Morrison but uh, you know it's kind of he ruined himself really uh <laughs> there's not so much a pushback against him it's just he kind of he dug his own hole um, and deserve the loss. Um, Pavel's joining us. I, I laughed when you said that, but uh, generally speaking, for, for an American audience that doesn't keep up with Aussie politics, is it as personality driven as it is here? Is it a big deal that your uh, politicians, especially at the prime minister level, at the legislative level in the parliament, do, do they need to be charismatic? Does personality matter, or are they usually more concerned with the actual governance? Um, I'd say it's becoming more personality focused. I guess that's a little bit of influence we're getting from America. Traditionally, maybe not so. Um, I, I guess a large part of the Australian public is just really apathetic to politics and policies. They don't care what the policies are. They don't know what the policies are. Um, so they choose whoever um, sounds best in the media um, or whoever cops the least heat in the media. So it's a really unfortunate system. Um, we also have mandatory voting. So there's just so many people who just did not want to vote, did not know who to vote for, but they get forced to vote. Um, and so, you know, they either vote for joke parties, minor parties, or, you know, spoil their ballot or just vote for the opposition because that's, you know, better than what we have now, I guess. <laughs> This is fascinating. Pavel's joining us from Australia because people here in America sometimes talk about mandatory voting, but you, you know, you're there, you guys experience, is it your experience that the mandatory voting actually adds to the apathy as opposed to maybe doing away with it, which is the argument of like, well, if everybody votes, there'll be more participation. You can't legislate people's hearts and minds, can you? Yeah, that, that's right. Um, I, I, well, I don't know, but yeah, I, I think it does add to the um, apathy. I, I just know so many people who they, they admit themselves that, look, you know, I don't think people like me should vote. Um, I'm not interested in it. Why, you know, am, am I going there to vote for a party that I have no idea what, what they stand for? Um, you, you would think that by making voting mandatory, you know, we would encourage the public to follow politics and understand it, but that's really not the case. Just so few people in Australia actually care. Um, so, you know, maybe it is better off leaving it to people who truly do want to vote. How much of that is a cultural thing? Because the stereotype of the Australian to the wider world is it's a lot more laid back than other parts of the country. Uh, you enjoy yourself. You like to have a good time. There's you know plenty of outdoor stuff. That's the stereotype. Does that play out in the politics when you're talking about the apathy, though? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think so. That's um, I guess the Australian public, uh, you know, she'll be right, mate. That's what they say. Um, they just want to just want to relax as long as you know, no one messes with them directly they really don't care what happens so you know that that um 
laid back personality is a double edged sword. You know, of course, it, you know, we live generally stress free lives and have a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, when it comes to politics, um, it can hurt us because, you know, we don't, we're not actually paying attention and then, you know, might elect a party that uh, doesn't have your best interests at heart. Yeah. Pavel's joining us from Australia in case you couldn't tell by the accent. Uh, since we we're on the topic, one of those things that has started to creep up in the Australian public and their politics specifically has really had to start paying attention to is uh, even though you're an island nation and an island continent, uh, no nation's really an island in this global economy. There's real issues going on globally that are really sucking Australia in. Obviously, China is a huge one with trade. Um, Australia's uh, what we call the Quad Agreement of Allies. That's becoming a thing. India is a major thing that's starting to affect Australia. Uh, Australia seems to be getting more and more pulled into world events, whether they really like it or not. Does it feel that way there as well? Um, well, definitely. I, I think um, half of the reason is that we actually want to be um, in these events. Um, you know, uh, typically the Australian government wants to um, promote ourselves on the world stage. We, we do punch above our weight. Uh, we definitely want to be a leader in the Asia Pacific, um, particularly as the only balance, uh, uh, I'd imagine, against China. Um, so we kind of represent um, Western democracy in the Asia Pacific. And, um, you know, some argue, you know, that we need to be more involved. Some argue that we should be less involved. Um, but, it, you know, it is good having us here and as an alternative um, ally uh, to China for some of these, um, you know, Pacific Islander nations. Yeah. And uh, just full disclosure, uh, I flew out of Iraq on an Aussie 130 on emergency leave. So I've always appreciated our Aussie buddies for giving me a lift when I really, really needed one out of Baghdad back in the day. So they, they've been good allies for a long, long time. Uh, let, let's double back to your piece for just a second and go back to domestic Australia to finish this up. Uh, you talked about it. You just mentioned it. Australia is a huge country with a relatively smaller population. One of the side items on this fuel price thing is because it's so big and it's so vast, America kind of has the same problem. The infrastructure is a little different. It's coastal heavy. It's population center heavy. Uh, is there something long term with these gas prices and things where they're going to start looking at infrastructure in Australia and be like, we may need to have a better plan for the century in the modern age we live in? Yeah, um, Australia, I guess, ever since World War II has been pretty poor on infrastructure. Um, unfortunately, you know, we had bigger, bolder plans um, earlier in the 20th uh, century. Uh, there is a plan for high-speed rail connecting a few regional towns and going from uh, Sydney to Melbourne. These things get floated all the time. But in reality, you know, nothing really gets done. Um, we, we take a huge amount of immigrants every year, 300,000 um, is what they're proposing. I think it's, it sits around 250,000 normally. And that's basically the size of our capital city every year. Now, these people don't go to small regional towns. They usually end up in, you know, Sydney, Melbourne, along the coast. And there's absolutely no plan to develop um, these regions or have the infrastructure support, support these um huge populations. We've got, you know, 95% of our population on this very small area along the coast, and it's just unsustainable. We, we need to have a plan um, to promote more people living in regional areas and spreading out our population because we just can't have, you know, a city like Sydney just growing to six, seven million while there are towns out there, um, you know, shrinking and dying. Yeah, universal problem, just the Aussie version of it. Uh, to wrap this up, you ended your piece on this. Uh, obviously, fuel prices play into other political and cultural things like cost of living. Like you just said, you know, immigration is an issue in Australia, even though you have very strict immigration laws. It's still a factor because of your smaller population. You say this gas thing's got about a six month window before it's got to be reviewed. Um, where do you think cost of living is going to be in six months? Is it still going to be a major issue? Do you think they do something different here? Just kind of project a little bit where you think. You're going because, you know, we're looking six months ahead here in the States because we're going to be having our election right about there. So everybody's wondering what the economy is going to be doing. Where are y'all going to be in about six months when this policy comes up for review? Yeah, so our inflation probably isn't as bad as America right now. So we're sitting at a uh, about 6% inflation expected by the end of the year. 
Um, but, you know, the cost of living is rising and there, there's been a lot of discussion and debate during the election um, that centred around cost of living. Um, I guess it's probably the core issue for most people other than climate change. Um, it would make sense that the government would keep the fuel taxes low um, if, if the price of oil and fuel is still high, affected by the war in Ukraine. Um, but as we know, this, this is, we've just elected a Labor government um, you know, who are, I guess, the Democrats of Australia. And typically they're not fond of tax cuts, so we're not too sure whether they'll keep it. Um, I don't even think the Liberals would have kept it if they remained in power. Um, so, you know, either way, we're not, we're not really getting a, a good result. Abel Fitzner, uh, second time on the show. There will be a third. We'd love to have you back again. Uh, appreciate the insight. He's a student. He studies law and obviously policy, really sharp guy. Always enjoy talking to our Aussie friends, my friend. Thank you for the time today, especially with the time difference. Go get yourself some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Great to be on. Good seeing you again, my friend. Thank you. Welcome back to Hurt Tell Show. Okay, it's all over the news headlines. People have been talking about it. We're going to talk about it with our friend Sean Timian. Did I get it right? I was practicing. Tima. Tima. No, Ia. Just ah. Ah, E. Ah. See, I, I'm a hillbilly. We can't do those vowel sounds. Phonics was the worst thing that ever happened to us. I, mean, <laughs> I swear. Sean Tima, uh, another great Young Voices contributor. We'd love to have them. Uh, he's a chief of staff for Young Americans for Liberty. He has been all over media, lots of appearances. Sir, thank you for the time. Deep from the heart of Texas, I appreciate you joining us. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. So the rumor mill has been going and going and going and going and going. I'm kind of confused as to whether we're still in the trial balloon stages or the assaging stages or where we're at with this. But we apparently are going to get some kind of a student debt relief something from President Biden somewhere in here. Uh, be that a change of pace or a change of subject or whatever, it seems like something's going to be coming out. Uh, is that your read as well? Because it keeps going, the numbers change. Now we're looking at maybe a $10,000 thing. Where do you think we're at in the news cycle on this? Because this has been allowed for a couple of months now. Yeah, well, we know that the left likes to dangle student loan debt relief whenever their poll numbers are dwindling with young Americans. They've never acted on it, but times may be so desperate for Biden and the rest of the Democrats, that they may actually bite on this one and upset some of their friends in the higher education cartel with Sally May and the banks and the CEOs of these loan collector companies. But it's important to remind people of two things when it comes to the student loan debt crisis. It's that uh, maybe even three things. We'll see how many I list off. But one, it's, ro it's wrong to rob Peter to pay Paul, right? And simply put, we shouldn't be asking blue collar working Americans or Americans who did not go to college to pay off the debts of people who went to Ivy League schools or got gender studies degrees. It's just not fair. And two, canceling student debt does nothing to actually reduce the cost of higher education. In fact, it incentivizes you know, the higher education cartel to continue these student loan programs and to continue raising the cost of college beyond a reasonable, affordable amount. So in this debate, it's important we bring those two things up. It's not fair and it's not going to solve any problems now let's i because i talked to our progressive friends as well the problem that the biden administration is going to have on a practical level is this ten thousand dollar amount seems to be a a unique bidenism of this seems to be ticking everybody off because the people that want it doesn't think it's going to be enough the people that don't want it at all think it's too much this seems like it's almost like you're it's like they're searching for an answer that's not going to make anybody happy that almost makes it even a worse policy doesn't it I agree. And I don't put it past Biden and his advisors to go up with the world's most milk toast option. That just seems like how they do business. But you're right. I mean, for people that are in $100,000 debt, $10,000 is, is just crumbs. Um, and it's still going to cost us a heck ton of money that we do not have as a country. I mean, we just printed $5 trillion over the last two years. And you see what that is doing to the price of gas and the price of food. I mean, there should be a robust debate 
uh, and a huge burden of proof to overcome if we are going to spend any more money or print any more money. But you're right. I don't think it's going to make anybody happy. Um, it's not fair <laughs> still, and it will do nothing to reduce the cost of higher education, which is the bigger problem in the first place. Sean Tima joining us. Okay, let me throw you some of the counter arguments and let's just work through them here. Uh, the first one is kind of the common sense one that sounds good on the service of, well, anytime you do debt relief to people, that's money that would go back into the economy or would go back into other things. What do we say to that argument? Yeah, well, you have to remember where the money is coming from, right? Inevitably, this money is going to be either taxed from people, which that money could have went into the economy, Right or it's going to be printed, which is pumping up the cost of every piece of the economy that you're looking to buy. So it's a wash at the end of the day, if you're raising the price through inflation and printing, or you're taxing people out of their money, you know, just to have that money being put into the economy. It's a broken window fallacy. All right. The other uh, thing that comes up with this is the demographics of who get this. Uh, the argument is, well, student loan debt would help the poorest Americans. But by the numbers, uh, this is actually a lot of middle uh, class and up folks that also have student loan debt. Not that a hundred thousand dollars of debt, even for somebody that's pretty wealthy, that's a lot of money. That's crippling debt by anybody's standards. We have sympathy for those folks, but what do we say to that argument? Yeah, well, the data shows the majority of student loan debt is owned by people with master's degrees and doctoral degrees. So if you are that smart to get out there and get that level of a higher education. And you should be smart enough to know how to pay on that debt yourself instead of relying on people who made a fiscally responsible decision to not take on massive debt, to go to trade school, to uh, pay off their debt. Uh, you know, So this isn't the grand subsidy for the poor that the left likes to pretend it is. This is subsidizing the Ivy League elites and the uh, arguably or uh, accordingly to the, to the degree standard, the smartest people in society. Now, let's take the other end of that for a second. You, you're a smart guy. You've seen these numbers already. The fact of the matter is something like 60% of Americans don't do any college whatsoever of any kind. At least they don't have a, a degree or a certificate attaining level of it. On the political side of this, 60-40 issues, the 40 side's usually not the edge of that on the political issues you want to get on. I understand the arguments folks are making. I'm sympathetic to people that want debt relief. But if you're on the wrong end of a 60-40 split, that just doesn't sound like it's going to be as politically advantageous as people are pitching it to me. I'm just talking straight on the numbers of it. Does it strike you that way, too? Yeah. According to a poll done by the Washington Examiner, you know, it's 60 percent of people polled said it would be unfair for those who didn't go to college to have to pay off the debts of those who did. You know, just about half of the American public, according to this poll, also believes it'd be unfair to those who took on debts and paid them off to then have to subsidize other people. So it's not like a, you know, 90-10 split. It's not like something that's going to energize, you know, the vast majority of Americans. This is going to make some people thankful. It's going to tick off a heck of a whole lot of other people and, you know, what are you really left with at the end of the day if you're the Democrats if you're Biden? You're you still got young people who are upset at the cost of living. You still got young people who are upset about a whole other variety of issues. So is it really worth you know, screwing up our economy and ticking off you know, half of the American public to maybe get the youth vote up just a little bit? I don't think so. Yeah, and I'm not sure this is aimed at the youth vote anyway. I think this is aimed at some, the donor class, for lack of a better way, but that's just my opinion. Uh, let me ask you a couple of things that you touched in on your piece, because you didn't just complain about it. You also offered some solutions. Here's a solution that I think would be, this would be a regulatory solution. This would be a really quick thing to do. I think it's the most common sense way to do it. Uh, talk about the bankruptcy option because we have protected student loan debt from bankruptcy. And I'm saying protected in air quotes here because that's a fallacy. Why can't, why is this the only debt in America that people can't discharge through bankruptcy, which is a fair process, which lets people fairly deal with their creditors and get some actual relief that's court mandated and protected, but not if you're a student loan debt. That doesn't make sense to a lot of folks. Why can't we just go that route? Yeah, well, one interpretation of the golden rule is uh, he who has the gold makes the rules, right? So you've got a lot of lobbyists from Sally May, a lot of lobbyists from the banks who made it so difficult for people to declare bankruptcy on their student loan debts. So that way the lenders could keep lending it out and having no repercussions if the loans didn't pan off. So you relax some of those laws, you allow people who may have been, you know, arguably, you know, put into this predatory system 
And I'm, I'm willing to call it a predatory system. That doesn't excuse the fact that we can just wipe all these loans off, but it's set up for a lot of people to fail, right? If they actually had to take on the risk of these lenders of saying, hey, we might lose our investment on these loans if these people just aren't making enough money or they made a poor decision, they went to study underwater basket, leaving their $100,000 in debt, uh, then maybe they would be less likely to actually give out that mass sum of loans in the first place. Um, so simply put, if you put the lenders on the hook and you allow people to declare bankruptcy, that has an effect where there's less loans going out. If there's less loans going out. The cost of college goes down. People can actually afford it without drowning in debt. Seems like a win-win to me. Yeah, Sean Tima joining us. Uh, I'm a practical guy. If we had a perfect world system where people sat down and discussed things, you know, even though I don't think it's the greatest thing in the world, I would trade an X amount of student loan debt to reform the system. I think that would be a good fair trade. But I think the repercussions here is if you don't reform the system first and then you forgive the debt, you're just increasing the predatory nature of the debt system. Am I wrong to think that way? Because I know even some pretty hardcore conservative people are like, look, if you can reform the system, you take the short term hit to get the long term benefit. I, I'd write off 30, 40, 50, whatever X amount of dollars to fix the system that's billions of dollars of predatory debt. But I don't see that here. I see something that might perpetuate the problem. Is that how you see it? Yeah, the top priority has got to be getting the cost of college down. And you can only do that by taking approaches that are going to hurt, you know, the elite class, uh, you know, in D.C. Um, and I really think, you know, and people say this is bold. People say this will have repercussions. But I really think the only way that we have a quick fix on this or something that makes a huge impact is if you take the root of the problem right at the heart of the problem. And that is cutting off, you know, these federal student loans for several years until colleges have to readjust and figure out what the heck is going on with their prices. Because they, they're able to jack up these prices because they know the government is going to take on the footing of the bill. 92% of all loans are federally guaranteed. That is unlike any other uh, free market system that's out there. Any other business can't afford to run on that. They have to set the prices to normal rates. But colleges get a free pass and administrators get all this extra money to spend on, on frivolous things. And banks are making hand over fist. I don't think that's fair to the student. So you take out the student loan program altogether Colleges have to trim the fat. They have to reset the normal. Then maybe we can actually start having the conversation about what to do to make amends from there. But you've got to get the cost of college down first. So legislatively, that's probably not going to happen anytime soon for a lot of reasons, because let's face it, both parties, a lot of them are higher education, most of them Ivy League educated in a lot of different ways. So let's talk about the other end of it, something we can maybe do. I think the real um, insipidous part of this thing is, and you touched in an, on, on your piece, and even people who are for student loan debt admit this is the problem. We are funneling kids into the college system that have no business going to college. And I don't mean they're not able to, they just don't want to or whatever. But this idea that every single kid has to go to college and therefore every single kid has to pay into the college system, I think that's where the real root of this problem is. That's something that's a cultural change, which is a hard change to do. It's a structural change in secondary education. That's also something we don't need legislative to do. That's something that can start being changed as a mentality. Where do you see that we can go in that direction in some practical ways? Yeah, it's it's on us. It's on business leaders. It's on parents. It's on families to just resist the uh, poor financial decision for a lot of these folks. Um, you know, you think of my cousin, right? My cousin's an incredibly gifted, uh, you know, a, a tradesman. He, he's studying to be an electrician now, but he went to two community colleges, racked up some debt and realized, hey, this isn't the place for me. I'm going to go to trade school. Um, he instinctually wanted to go to trade school, but he thought that his ticket to prosperity and that the right thing to do was to go to college, right? In, in liberal arts, because that's what he was told was a marker of success. Um, and there's no, you know, one legislative bill or, you know, one statement from a president that's going to change that. I mean, that's just got to come from a bottom up solution, you know, from family saying, you know what, it's okay if my kid does not go to college, because you look at the data, people who go to trade school, people who take alternate paths, 
when you factor out the student loan debt, when you look at the starting salaries of a lot of these jobs, they end up evening out with a lot of liberal arts degrees without the debt. So we've just got to be able to continue to share that information and make that a cultural norm, person by person, leader by leader, until we start to see a cultural change. Now, folks will argue, Sean Tima joining us, that you need to keep up with high tech stuff. But the fact of the matter is companies like even like an Amazon and Google, they're starting to have in-house recruiting now where they're bringing people straight in. They're doing in-house training and quote unquote college in-house so that they have those employees from the go. It's almost the old apprenticeship starting to reemerge because even these major companies are like, hey, these these degrees are all kind of running together and they're not telling us anything about what kind of employee we're getting. So the old argument that to be high tech, you got to go to college, it's not holding up. And I think the other thing that's not getting talked about is you just spent two years telling kids they could do school online. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of kids are going to like the flexibility. They don't like it for high school because of the social stuff. A lot of those community college kids, a lot of those trade school kids, I think you're going to see an explosion of online learning or probably more specifically hybrid learning where they're like, hey, I can do this cheaper on the road, plus I can Mm -hmm. work or I can work on my online stuff or I can work on my influencing or whatever the case may be. I think there's going to be a cultural change long before there's an institutional change. And maybe that's how this starts to get changed a little bit. What do you think? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And that's, you know, a silver lining of COVID. We have to look for those silver linings. And one of those is realizing, hey, I can progress, you know, in my uh, quote unquote necessary, you know, education behind the computer screen, right? To, to get what it takes to actually get out there and get the job and get the qualifications. Um, so I think people are going to be a lot more accustomed to online learning. I think too, you know, you mentioned Amazon and Google. There are some private businesses that are really stepping up the way I see it, and providing those transformative uh, solutions and breaking the mold, like Praxis, which I'm sure you're familiar with. They're a group that is an alternative to college. You know, it's apprenticeship based. So the idea is you go in, you pay the tuition, you get trained up for six months, you do a maybe a one year apprenticeship. Uh, and by the end of that apprenticeship, uh, if you succeed, you will have earned back the tuition that you paid into Praxis in the first place, right? So it's kind of like a, a wrinkle in time of getting you from, uh, you know, the classroom into the job you want rather than having to do the four years of college and all the debt. Um, these programs are out there. And, you know, with, with good marketing and good word of mouth, we can make people realize that, hey, the, the four-year university model is not the only way to go. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you one more thing before we let you go. You touched in it on your piece. Uh, I'm a lower level guy. I think lower level is a good way to start with a solution maximizing people's own money for college. We talked about how ridiculously expensive it is, but there is some ways we can practically let people do it. You talked about 529 investments. Um, I've got a daughter that's got a 529. She got it from the uh, do it for baby dog COVID vaccination program of all the things. Hmm. Uh, But I mean, it's a fantastic thing. It's a large amount of money. It's in a 529 actually draws interest. She earned money on it before she even started cracking it for college stuff. What would it take to do some just some basic regulatory form? Because the truth of the matter is these 529s are wonderful tools. There's a lot of IRS restrictions and gatekeeping on how the money can get into them, get out of them. There could be some regulatory fixes here that just lets people use their own money more effectively in higher education, isn't there? Absolutely. Well, the two main ones you have are 529s and then something called a Coverdale ESA. Both of them, you're able to put money in and get some tax benefits, able to draw that money tax-free when it's time to pay for college. But the problem is there's all these hidden rules built in. Like in the 529s, you can't invest in most mutual funds or ETFs or individual stocks. It has to be these pre-approved sets of investment options. In the Coverdale ESAs, you can take more risk with the range of uh, investment portfolio options, but you can only give $2,000 a year. So why these are there, uh, I, I think the burden of proof is to, on the other person to tell me why they're there in terms of why we shouldn't be able to take greater risks you know, with, with funding and education, especially when the government has jacked up the price so much. But if you just remove some of those barriers, you let people invest in cryptocurrency and in individual stocks, you remove the $2,000 cap, you know, let people take risks with their own money that they have earned. Clearly, the government doesn't know how to manage money well for $30 trillion in debt. Social Security is going insolvent. Who are they to tell the American citizen, actually, we need to help you make sure you don't lose your money? Uh, Seems kind of ridiculous to me. And if you never heard of the Coverdales, they're kind of, think IRA. You can only put X amount of money into them. That's sort of the model that was based on. All right, Sean, one last question for you. 
Uh, I know we talked about this. This is a loud issue. It's probably going to get louder, especially if uh, President Biden takes action on it. Let's assume he does this $10,000 proposal and just basically nobody's happy with it. What's the next phase of this debate, do you think? Yeah, well, it really depends who is in power, right? If this mobilizes, you know, a right of center turnout and you've got the Democrats losing because they gave $10,000, I don't see the Republican Party when they control the House and Senate letting any kind of uh, student loan debt relief pass through, right? But if something wild happens and this mobilizes more Democratic turnout because they say, hey, they didn't go far enough, you vote for us, we're actually going to push Biden to do more, right? Then you have a, a long shot chance of this being the stepping stone to full debt relief, right? Either way, let's remember, it's not fair to rob Peter to pay Paul, right? People took out those loans. They can pay them off more than about half of everyone who took out student loans has paid them off. This is not some impossible task to consider. Personal responsibility, fiscal responsibility go a long way, right, in terms of developing you know, the citizens we like to see today, and we can't afford it. So no relief should be given. We should focus our energy on reforming the system, making it easier for people to get out of the debt, and for that debt to not even be a possibility in the first place. I think that's how you get to a fairer system, a more sustainable system, and one that isn't built on just political appeal to uh, staying in office. Yeah, Sean Tima joining us. We also need to point out here, uh, this executive action will very definitely wind up in court as well because there's some legalities on how much they can actually do here. So we need to mention that as well. Uh, Sean Tima, thank you so much for the time talking student loan debt. Let folks know where they can follow you, your writing and your social media and whatever else you have going on until we talk to you again. Absolutely. We can follow me on Twitter at Liberty Sean. And you can follow all the great work that uh, Young Americans for Liberty is doing at, at YA Liberty, one L. And uh, the, his piece is in the American Spectator. We will link to it in the show notes so you can read it for yourself. Sean, thank you so much for the time today. Appreciate it, sir. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll talk again soon. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Uh, that'll do it for her tell. I know we've been off for a while, so it's a good time to review things, whether it's a full episode, maybe it's one of the good talk interview portions, or you want to go through one of the twice on Sunday review shows. Those are all on all the platforms, whether it's iTunes or Spotify, if you like the podcast version of the show or on the YouTube channel. Uh, always happy to see you on that. All of those do very, very well. We greatly appreciate you. They're all completely free. All you got to do is sign up and subscribe and you'll get all of those products. We're very happy. We're looking forward to getting back into the swing of things here on Herd Tell. Now, sometime this summer, I'm going to be taking more time off for medical stuff, so just follow us on the social media. We'll try to keep you updated as best we can. There are days that I just cannot do the program, so if I'm not here, that's what's going on. Uh, some of that's medication, some of it's treatments, some of it's I have appointments, so on and so forth. We'll try to keep you up to date as best we can. We want to work as much as we can because we love doing it. It's a privilege to get to do this, and you give us the most precious thing. You have your time. We're going to respect it as much as we can with our own time. So thank you so much for sticking with us. Sorry for the absence. We'll try to make it up to you. So until we talk to you again, wherever you and yours are across the street or around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. Can't wait to get back in the swing of things with you right here on Herd Tell. Take care. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. Oh,